This time I got another Betamax in. This is a SLHF 360 Super Betamax Hi-Fi. This one here, I thought when I first plugged it in that it had just dirty heads, but it turns out it's a little more serious than that. This one's got some components that are bad on it. So we're going to have to do a little bit of testing and uh, figure out where the problem is, which would be a lot easier if I had a schematic for it, but I don't. So let's get started. Got another Sony Betamax in here. This one's an SLHF 360 Super Beta Hi-Fi. Uh, be a two-head machine. I'm told it has a bad picture. Let's see. Looks like the heads may be clogged. That's what that looks like. Let's uh, see if that's it or if there's something else. Okay, this is the 711 B3, I believe, was this chassis. Because the original was the original 711 was the one that was used in the SL2000, SL2500, 2000, SL 2500 and 2700. And then they had the SL... Uh, or then they had the 711 B2 chassis which is the one that had the plunger and the the uh, tooth belt to drive the front loader this one is the B3 what they called the plungerless design or solenoidless design We've got one motor for the tape compartment the, the elevator one motor that controls the threading and unthreading and it also controls the application of the pinch roller that's the second motor. The third motor is the capstan motor, and the fourth motor is the drum. So this is a four-motor system. Okay, let's uh, clean this machine and see if there's anything else that might be problematic on here. Everything else seems to, well, mechanically it looks like it's working. Okay, let's clean the heads. Let's just see whether whether it's just dirty heads on it. It just it looks like it looks like dirty heads from from uh, what I saw there. And it didn't appear to be that dirty. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look good. I know there's some damage on the tape there, but to uh, let the damage section get past. So that's as good as it gets. Adjust the track and control. Like the tracking control, I'm playing with it now. We have the heading called View Circuits for the SLHF 900. The first one is uh, the Super Beta Switch. We've been talking about that. I think this and interference we see here is just a. Uh, I think that's just an artifact from the. Plasma. If I put this on a CRT, we'll, we'll take a look at this on a CRT and see how it looks. Okay, that's that's more like it. So, as you can see, it's not tracking properly. That's an insert that I did using an SLHF 900 with no flying erase heads, and it shows. Yes, a 900 could do the insert, and it would look like that. That's what the 1000 solved. This machine has a servo problem. As you can see, the servo is not locked. That All those lines we were getting in the middle of the screen here, whoops, on, when I was on the plasma, that was just the plasma itself not able to, uh, to 
lock into the signal. But here we look at it on an analog monitor and it's a lot more clear as to where our fault is. We have a problem in the servo circuit. It should be maybe caps and servo. Adjusting the tracking control. Doesn't really do much. It still does that. Okay, so we have to troubleshoot the, the uh, servo circuit. That's going to be interesting. I wonder if it's drum servo. You see, back in the old days, we had fluorescent lights which strobed at uh, 120 hertz, right? 60 hertz power supply, 120 pulses, or 120 flashes per second. But now we're dealing with LEDs and so forth that don't strobe and that looks fine. I'm going to uh, turn on my fluorescent light. This guy. And we'll see whether... And of course turn out the shop lights and we'll see whether that drum... Does this work? Kill the shop lights. Look at that. You see the drum. There it goes. God damn. The drum is losing lock the drum servo. The drum servo is losing lock. Every time that does it, there's tracking bars. There they go. When I play with the uh, tracking control, that doesn't make any difference because the tracking control is changing the phase of the caps and servo. This has got a drum servo problem. Maybe a capacitor that's gone bad. But you can see it there it goes and when I had the regular lights on because I've got I mean I have fluorescent lights in here I have a magnetic ballast on fluorescent lights over my bench but I've also got a bunch of LEDs and the LEDs of course are running on DC they will just use a basic current limiter and uh, you can still see it because the fluorescent light's still on, but if I turn the fluorescent light out. Now you don't see it. That's the advantage of uh, fluorescent light. I wonder if these other LEDs will show. Probably not. How about this one? Probably not as well because it's, after all, an LED. Can't see it right interesting okay now we know where to look I think I kept that old magnifier around I hardly ever use it but I have it here and in this case it's saved me a lot of trouble looking for a fault because it's showing me exactly where to look even with the other lights on it probably will show be enough there'll be enough uh, strobing effect there you can see it there you go yeah okay Let's uh, deal with this problem. Now I know where to look. I'm going to be looking in the drum servo circuit. Servo circuit's over here. Um, where's the caption servo? The caption's in here somewhere. FG amp. And uh, I thought I saw one that said subtracting. One of these is in here. So the, the caption servo circuit. There's a couple of these little standoffs on the board meaning there's probably glue under them that might be uh, shut it off I'm going to take this take these off the board here just see whether there's any circuit glue or any residue from the, the adhesive they used
see any deterioration. Sometimes you'll find a deterioration under when there's a, been a, a, a you know, double-sided tape or glue or anything. I don't see any on here. I'm gonna probably have to put the scope on and just see if I, if everything looks right. Of course, we can always use the old wet finger trick. Plug it back into my plasma here, just so that I can. It's easier to see this. The other monitor, the uh, the tripod is right in the way. <laughs> but this is the way it works. The machine gets rid of all that weak uh, emphasis at the high frequency that you put in. Well, that's capstan. But maybe not all of it. So the soft limiter here, the dynamic emphasis, settings the uh, amplitude or the strength of the high frequency. Oops. Okay, I just made the drum go wild. Rather severely, then. Somewhere in here. Watch the TV, I'll show you the monitor. Okay, so you can see it's still doing the thing. If I get a wet finger in here. Something in here. Yeah, but we're emphasizing it a second time. We emphasize it before we emphasize it. Yeah. 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 It could be causing problems, and maybe I'll put, well, I'm put the scope on here. Not maybe grab the scope, see if I can see anything. I don't know what I'm looking at on this, so because I don't have a schematic handy, I really need a uh, I need a schematic to, to troubleshoot this type of stuff. And I don't have one, and I don't feel like looking for one. I'm sure they're out there, but most of these most of these websites have become paywalls these days. There's not too many out there that are willing to give you information for free. They always want money. Okay, uh, watch this. I'll show you guys the scope. Wish I had both cameras out here. I see the the, um, the waveform takes a dump. When every time it does this, the waveform here takes a dump. I'll show you guys the scope. Watch. There it goes. See that? Every time it loses sync, that waveform changes. See? That's in the phase control, I think. What happens if I now if I touch the drum and slow the drum by hand, that's the speed control. Okay, so uh, that's that's the output. That's going to be the output from the, the servo for the sample and hold, I think. Because if I slow the drum down, you will see it jump to try to speed it back up. If I'm, I'm physically turning the drum speed down now by just touching the drum. And as you can see, that servo is trying to bring the speed back up. So that part's working. I wonder where the problem is. There's a little sample and hold cap in here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. What's that? have a unique looking waveform, isn't it?
That's the PG pulse. You can see it on here as well. Every time it drops, see the pulses are changing for the speed. If I touch the drum, that's me slowing it. So when I slow it, the, the uh, pulses move to the right. And then when it loses its sync, it got shifted to the left. Hmm. There's a couple of little sample and hold caps down in here. That's moving as well. That pulse. See the pulse moving there? That's moving whenever the disruption occur is occurring. Hmm. Should just lift right off this cover. What is holding it up? Oh, there's a clip down here. On the bottom, there's a clip. Right in the middle. There we go. That's better. Okay. Now, to flip up this board, now the display is part of it. That's why I have to take the front cover off. Be able to just remove a couple of screws and flip this board out of the way to the service position. Because you know, machines like this were made back in the day when service was something that you were expected to do. All right, okay, so where I am uh, experiencing the signal that's changing is right in this area here there's a couple of little caps down here oh there's one of these little blue buggers too these sanyo these ones were were always problematic uh these light blue they're a solid type aluminum cap made by sanyo that makes life's good things worse isn't that what their slogan was hmm I wonder if it's one of these little bastards. I bet it is. I bet one of these is causing it. These are both in the, I think these are the caps inside though. This is this is the drum side. This is the side I was seeing the disruption on. Unless they're somehow wired. Well, they both go into the chip, so maybe uh, internally that's the, the servo side or the drum servo. Hmm. I think I'm going to change them, just for the hell of it. I'll change these out. Just because I remember my days at Sony with the SL5000 series, and we had to change out, literally there was like 47 of these on the servo board, and we had to change every single one of them out. We replace them with little tantalum caps. I probably can just use the regular electrolytic on here. I don't think there's anything that's critical. But let's uh, let's change these out the size of these things. They're only 85 degree, which means that they, you know, there's nothing special about them. But what are they? What size are they? Uh, they are um, 33 mic. What is this one? That uh, first one's a 33, and this one is uh, is about so a 33. That's a 47. Okay, I'm going to change out both of these. Let me warm up my soldering iron. We'll change both of these out. See whether that fixes the problem with the servo. It might. I can't see these ones being going bad. These, these type of caps usually don't fail. Could be this one here too. 22 at, at, at or 2.2 at 50. I mean, that's, that's in the circuit. Definitely in the circuit, right in that area of the circuit. So, could be that one. And these ones over here, just because of I know that these these light blue, they're they're not an electrolytic. They're a solid cap, but they're not 
tantalum or solid aluminum cap and I just know from experience dealing with the old beta machines that I had to repair when I worked for Sony I spent months just changing caps that was my job I was basically QA um, quality assurance to make sure that these machines when they went to market weren't going to blow up within the first year or weren't going to fail because they had a massive a massive failure of Sanyo made solid caps and we changed every single one of them out on every single machine and they never came back so maybe we'll start by changing those two and just see whether changing those two fixes the problem I'm going to change this one as well this this um this 2.2 at 50 I'll change that one and these two I will we'll see what happens So the first one I'll do is this 2.2 that's over here. Probably measure it too with the ESR meter, but Should we measure it just for the hell of it? See whether it's bad. One point eight. That's not bad. You know, it doesn't. It's a two point two at fifty volts, and it's measuring one point eight. Hmm. Should I change it? It's not measuring bad, that's the thing. It's just, it's not measuring high ESR. I'd like to be able to uh, measure things. Oh, this is a bipolar cap. I can't change this anyway, but it's, I bet it's okay. This one's a bipolar cap, so we're gonna put it back. 2.2. Yeah, this, this one's okay. Yeah, a bipolar, we won't change the bipolar because I don't have one. So I'll put that one away. I'll show this one back on the board and we'll change the other two out. So C926 is the first one I'm going to change. Uh, right here. This is the 3.3. Um, oh, it's a 0.33. A 0.33. Is, is the other one a 0.47? That's a really, that's really small. It's a 0.33. Okay, well, I, I should have one of those. Is the other one a 0.47 or is it 47? It might be a 0.47. It's hard to see. Let me find a 0.33. I'm pretty sure I've got a 0.33. See, this one says Sanyo on it. These were the, these were the ones that gave us all the trouble, and that is definitely a 
The other one is this one over here. C941. C941. Forty-two is the one next to it. Nine forty-one. Um, this one out. No, this one's probably a point four seven. Nine forty-one, right there. Funny story to tell you today. I I sold one of my three quarter inch machines. A point forty seven. It is a point forty seven. Sold my three quarter inch machine today, and um, so I offered to deliver it. So I'm coming back, and you know it's just just after lunch. I figured I'm going to grab a grab a lunch. And there's a a seafood place that I sometimes go to if I'm passing through because they got really good fish and chips and on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday it's all you can eat so um, I go in there and I place my order and I'm having my lunch and then I hear commotion going on at the next table and I did fl I, I did flip my camera on on my phone to record what was going on because I just couldn't believe it that somebody got caught sharing like the, the sign says when you order all you can eat, it's per plate, but it's per person. So, like, one person can't go in and order all you can eat and then share it with everybody else at the table. But there was this couple that was there. I don't know whether it was, whether they were a couple or whether one was the son and one was the mother. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you because they were kind of behind me, but I could hear the commotion going on where they got caught. And they were told, you, you can't share. We caught you sharing. So we're going to charge you another 16 bucks or whatever it is for the all-you-can-eat plate. And the woman was most upset. So she's complaining to the, the waitress. I guess this waitress isn't getting a tip. Um, she's complaining to her about this, about it being unfair, and that she's been going in there for 24 years, and she wants to talk to the manager. So the manager comes out, and this went back and forth for a good... I'm going to say, well, it went back and forth for the... The time I was eating, so this went back and forth for for quite a while. You know, it was it's probably five minutes. Anyway, um, the manager, you know, the, the woman's going on about I've been coming here every week for 24 years, and the manager she says, well, I've worked here for 30 or for 28 years, and I, you know, I've seen you here before, you know, but you you can't do that. It's it's. You know, that's the rule. The rules are the rules. I don't make up the rules, but those are the rules. You know, it's, it, she said, I'll tell you what. She says, I will charge you for one piece. One extra piece. Like if you had ordered a separate piece, which is $3. Right? I'm not, you know, I'm not going to let you get away with it for nothing. I think the woman, the woman that was pinching up the other person's food that ordered all you can eat, she ordered something like, something small, right? And then she was taking pieces from, and the other person keeps ordering extra and she was taking pieces off of the plate and eating it. It's like, talk, up, talk about cheap. Talk about being just cheap. And uh, anyway, this went on for, for several minutes and uh, I just couldn't believe it. I said, to the, uh, I said to the lady, the waitress, when I was leaving, I said, I said, unbelievable. Some people just don't get it. She laughs. She says, yeah. And she says, and I, I told her I was giving her a deal and she wanted more. She wanted more. She wanted it free. And I, I looked at her. I said, oh, I said, you've got more patience than me. I would have just pointed at the sign and said, simple question. Do you or do you not know how to read English? And pointed at the sign where it says, all you can eat, no sharing permitted. I said, that would have been the end of it. I said, if it had been me, I said, it would have just been... Can you or can you not read English? 
As soon as they say yes, well, there it is right there. No sharing. You're paying the full $16.95 or whatever it costs. Let's uh, see if this works. Hey. That's an insert. That's an insert edit. I'm just going to adjust the tracking. This is me adjusting the tracking. This was really dark when this was recorded. But you know what? I'm not seeing the servo disruption. God damn. It was those Sanyo or one of these or both of these bloody Sanyo cheap crap aluminum solid caps. I mean, I just put in cheap electrolytics. What I had. And that sucker is stable. Give the wet finger in here. Well, this is working. Let's try a different tape. Let's try something that wasn't recorded with Control Darkness. That was the Super Beta. Training tape. Let's try the aquarium tape that was recorded in Super Beta. So I'll turn Super Beta on. Just for tracking. Looking good. Looking very good. Another tape here. This should be uh, my Las Vegas Neon Master. So this should be the tape that came out of the camera. It would have been shot on. I don't think this was shot on a beta movie. Oh, wrong button. What did I press? Play back. City. This is the raw footage. If you look up my big uh, drop it's a good thing I digitized this thing like a dozen years ago. And I put it together to music and it's up on my YouTube channel and it's had thousands of views, but this is the this is the raw footage to what I what I did. Got a color level control on here. You can turn the color up or down. Three position switch. One, two, and three. Actually, aside from all the bloody dropouts, it's not looking too bad. I was wondering why I'm seeing so many dropouts. Usually, these machines had a switch for um, PCM. And if that PCM switch was on, it turned off the dropout compensator. I'm just looking for it here. 
Thank you. I know the earlier machines all had a switch. It would say PCM on or off, and that's because you could use one of these with a PCM adapter and use them as a high quality audio recorder. It would, record, it would, it would encode the audio as a, as a video signal that was recorded by the video drum in full digital. But in order to use it, you had to uh, disable the piece or disable the dropout compensator because dropouts. What would happen is the circuitry would repeat the previous line to try to cover up a dropout, and that would make the PCM not work. It would mess with the error correction. That tape is not it's looking pretty rough, but again, it's, it's old. It was recorded back in the 1980s. I don't know if I have a date on here, but um, 1985, maybe? 86? It might have been 86. 85 or 86, I forget. Anyway, this one's playing okay, so I guess it's time to throw it together and get it out of here. The hell of it, let's just take a look at these caps, the ESR wise. Five? It's not too bad for a really low, uh, maybe it's a short. Might be a short. Really low ESR for a real small cap like this. So what do they measure in terms of uh, capacity? Might help if I put the meter in capacitor checker mode. 0.74, and this one was a 0.47, and this is the 0.33. What is it going to measure? Point four nine. So they're certainly uh, not measuring the spec, that's for sure, but as you saw, I just changed those two caps. I did nothing else to this unit. I did not make any adjustments. I initially cleaned the heads and I changed out those two caps and this unit is now working. So there you go. Even though they test, they look to be okay. But again, these were the ones, as I mentioned before, these were solid. They're like a tantalum cap. You can see them. I'll put some light on here. There's no vent. They're solid. They're made by Sanyo. And these were what we had to change on all of those SL5000 series. 5000, 5010, 5020. Um, 5200 all the, the original large top loader or not top loader front loader but the, the, the not the slim line the top the high ones um, with the 710 chassis we had to change our little pull the servo board and we had a template that we put over it that fit over all the caps that had to be changed there was like 47 of them that had to be changed out but at least this one only had two anyway um, I think that pretty much does it so let's throw this one back together Okay, all done. Now I'm not saying that I wouldn't have found this without putting a fluorescent light on it and watching for the drum going out of sync. But initially I was thinking that it was a capstan servo problem, when in fact it turned out to be a drum servo problem. And by using the stroboscopic effect of a magnetic ballast fluorescent lamp, I was able to see that drum going out of sync. Look at this, look at the tape. Those spools used to be white at one point, and they've yellowed over the years. That one stayed white. That one stayed white. That one turned yellow. And no, it's not a scotch tape, it's a Sony. This is a Sony tape. 
It's just in the wrong type of, in the wrong, wrong uh, jacket. Actually, I think that's probably the one for this one, which has got the training seminar on it. But again, it's, they've stayed white. Anyway, um, it's too hot in here. Even with the AC on, it's still hot. I'm going to call it a night. I'm going to go in and we'll catch you in the next one. But here we go, another Betamax saved from the scrap bin and uh, back in service. Again, I'm getting a lot of these machines now. I think people are starting to go through their collection of old tapes and they're digging out machines and wanting to digitize stuff that they've got on tape. And I'm starting to get lots of requests for uh, lots of VCRs. Anyway, we'll catch you in the next one. This is how many beta? How many beta is that? This is this last couple weeks. Four beta and two super VHS. Or is it three? Might have been three VHS. Anyway, I've seen a few of them. I'm sure I'll see some more. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye. There's another clock from my old Blackberry. Gotta like it.